Oh gosh. Uh, oh, what do I do now? Uh, I, I want to pick up on the symbiotic thing that uh, uh, Peter was talking about. Um, whatever, we've, whatever we're doing at the SACE board, whatever we've been able to achieve and whatever we're able to achieve in the future is because we're just one part of an education system uh, in South Australia. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today and where we want to take the SACE um, isn't about the SACE, it's about the system. It's about uh, how what we're doing connects with your story, connects with our story in South Australia. I hear so many people. I hear so many people talking about um, kind of achievement of students and the focus on the ATAR and all of those things. And even the SACE board, we talked about success for all. Um, and when we talk about success for all, we mean getting the SACE, and that's not enough because it depends what the SACE is. It depends what it means by getting the SACE, and that's what uh, I want to focus on over the next few years with you and your focus on what it means to students to get the SACE. And so the SACE board has adopted this now, not as our vision or our mission, but as our purpose. So this is our purpose statement now, that what we want to do is to shape education so that students thrive. We've specifically said shape because we don't control and we don't direct and neither should we. Um, you shape education, we shape education, the students in our classes, in our schools shape education. We're all in it together, uh, shaping education so that students thrive. Why, why should we focus on those things? Well, I want to show you a bit of, of data. I wanted to just pick out one idea. This is the idea about belonging. This is some PISA data about our 15-year-olds. Um, in the OECD in Australia. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take off the OECD data just to leave the Australian data. So what we're seeing here from left to right are measures of belonging. And so the higher up the scale, the greater the proportion. So it goes up to 100%. Uh, and the higher up the scale, the greater the belonging. And so the statements are, if I go from left to right, uh, this is students responding to these statements. I make friends easily at school. I feel like I belong at school. Other students seem to like me. I feel like an outsider or left out of things at school. I feel awkward and out of place in my school. And I feel lonely at school. And so, of course, if I feel lonely at school, that's students who disagree with that because more belonging, uh, the higher up it is. So the gold spots are 2003. So in 2003, that's what 15-year-olds in Australia said. And so we saw things like 95% of students said that other students seemed to like me in, uh, in 2003. And then over the years, from 2003 to 2012, that's the movement from the gold spot down to the gray spot. And you can see that some things have moved a bit and some things have moved quite a lot. I'm about to put on the 2015 data. So 2003 to 2012, that, the nine years there, and then another three years later, students were asked that same question, those same questions again. So what do you think? So just, you know, one minute at your table, what do you think? Did it go down, did it bounce back? Is it the same? What do you think the student's response would have been in 2015? And you know, right? Because you know that this is a rhetorical question, really. You know, <laughs> you know what's going on. So in 2015, 2015, the data looks like this. So if I look to the far right, more than 15% of Australian students say that they feel lonely at school. But the one that I really want to focus on is, of course, is the school one. Because, you know, other students seem to like me. That's not changed so much. The kind of social stuff is still there. 
But the big change, and of course the, the one that we see as being the lowest, is that I feel like I belong at school. So, so a real challenge though in terms of that, that belonging construct in, nationally, and of course in the Department of Education, that, the Wellbeing and Engagement Survey, um, there's also another construct um, about belonging at school, and it's this construct. And if you look at the data just for the department overall, going from year four through to year 10, what I'm showing here is in the green, this is the proportion of students who always feel like connected and valued at their school. Um, the red is those that never do, and the yellow is, is those that essentially give a mixed response. And so we see this change over the years, probably not too surprising, but really if we put the PISA data on there, we see this real kind of similarity between the PISA construct and our South Australian um, data as well. And I know lots of you are working on this. You might have seen this in your data, and if you have, you're working on it in your schools. And there's lots, of, I've skipped over a lot of data just to, uh, just to keep this brief, but I just want to show you this data from, from PISA. Um, again, Australian data. And what this is showing us is those same constructs, those same items of friends, schools, students, out, I feel like an outsider and so on. And what we're seeing here in each of the groups is going from lowest SES to highest SES. So this construct of belonging is an, is an interesting construct, right? Because it's something about um, my sense of belonging. We know it's closely connected with achievement. And we also start to see that it's connected to equity. Um, and the outcomes for young people. And so for me at the SACE board, what I'm thinking about is, I know you're thinking about this, I know you're working on this, so my challenge is, well, how does curriculum and assessment help? In fact, that's the wrong question. The question is, how could it help? And in fact, that's the wrong question. Because the, because the right question is, how should it help? Because it should help. It should, be part, it should help you with your story. It should help to develop that sense of belonging. Students should have, should have a sense of belonging created by what they're learning and in the classroom. We might be able to shape that at the SACE board through what we do. We can't control it. There's so many other things. We work in complex systems. We don't work in a complicated system. We work in a complex system. There's so much going on. But that means that we at the SACE board, we have to play our part in that complex system. All the bits have to move to get any change. So I need to make sure that the SACE board, what we do in curriculum and assessment, moves as well in order to get that, uh, those outcomes that we're looking for. So belonging has got to be part of Thrive. So when we say we're just going to shape education so that students thrive, we need to think about, well, what does that mean? What does that construct mean? And if you think about it in terms of what's going on at the moment with COVID, even more of a demand on us you know, where we see students who are thriving students, they've got that resilience, and we've seen that in our students. We've got that, that resilience to bounce back. Students who don't have that resilience, students who weren't thriving, are the students who are just not coming back to school. And so in, the, in our strategic plan, when we think about, well, what does thrive mean? We're characterizing it through these six, uh, through these six elements. And belonging is there as one of those key elements. The curriculum, what we do at the SACE board, should be develop, helping you to develop a sense of belonging in your, with your students. We've got at the bottom there, I've got deep understanding and skillful action. We're not, we're not, we're not losing that, but it's not stuff. It's, it's not just stuff. It's not stuff to remember. It's stuff to understand. It's discipline, understanding, and skillful action. Um, top left, we've got that ability to transfer because no, none of us want students to be learning in order to do the exam. We want students to learn in order to be able to use that learning to transfer it into ways, into situations that are different from the way in which they learned it. Student agency, of course, is a key part of that. Students having control over their learning, control over their assessment, students presenting evidence of what they're learning um, against a performance standard and saying, I think this is evidence of this learning. Because they're gonna have to do that not just in school, they're gonna have to do that all through their lives to develop that, the, those skills, that knowledge, that understanding, and show people that they've got those, those skills, that knowledge and understanding to present evidence of it. We've also got human connectedness in there. We think that's really important. And it's separate from belonging. 
All these things are actually connected, of course. Um, they're interconnected, but not and not in, independent. Because uh, you have to be. So if you can see that, you know, if you're really developing agency, then of course we are developing that ability to transfer. We are developing that deep understanding and skillful action because students are getting in there and driving their own learning. These things should be connected. But the human connectedness for us is about that learning together, is about challenging us to say, well, how are we going to assess? Because we used to make it so that kids essentially had to sit in their own boxes and we would assess them individually within that box and they would never, ever have to do that again because they always have to be able to demonstrate that they were effective with other people. So we need that connectedness. We need that collaboration. Lots of the research that we looked at was telling us that one of the biggest challenges to childhood and adolescence was excessive individualism and that shift away from excessive individualism to help young people to be effective learners, to be effective operators uh, with other people. There's, uh, in the Australian Qualifications Framework, that's the framework that levels all of the vocational education, degrees, masters, PhDs, that kind of thing, and says what is required at all those levels. Uh, senior secondary is in the framework, but it's not leveled within the framework. It has this kind of complex relationship. And they've just been doing a review of the AQF, the Australia, Australian Qualifications Framework, and it was absolutely clear, and I've told some of you this story before, we were sat around, it was all of the... Uh, chief executives of the curriculum authorities from all the states and territories and the person who was doing the AQF review and he said, well we're just assuming in the AQF review that senior secondary is all about lifelong learning that's what senior secondary is and I asked the question who here, chief executives of the curriculum authorities, who here thinks they're certifying lifelong learning and the chair actually from New South Wales said well we're not we're certifying subjects So are we. I mean, I am. We are. That's what you get on your certificate, right? We're certifying subjects, and we shouldn't be. We should be certifying more than that, because that's our promise to students through our education system, that they will learn more than that, that they'll have more than that. They'll have more than subjects and their ATAR. So we built this, um, yes, looking at the literature, working with experts. We, we built this talking with teachers, education leaders, students. We built this talking with, educate, uh, with universities and industry as well about what they would need from that. And this is the position that we've landed on. And now this is part of our purpose. So now at the SACE board, when we're developing exams, we're developing new assessments, we're changing subjects, we're developing subjects. Whatever we're doing, I'm demanding that everybody looks to this and says, how is what we're doing helping students to thrive? Because if it's not, we're not doing it. And if there's another way of doing it better, then we're going, to do it th we're going to do it that way better. All my governance committees now, the board itself, are going to do our governance through this. How is the SACE board achieving this? Because if you're not, we're not doing it. We're doing something else. Let me give you a quick uh, insight into, you know, what, when we pitch these ideas to teachers, students, parents, what we're starting to hear back. You know, it's that light bulb moment when a kid finally gets something and you just see it, the shine in them, and they go, oh, hang on, that means this and that means that. And it's the students that can look at it in that regard and go, okay, so I'm going to take this concept and I'm going to flip it and apply it to something else. And to be adaptable and be able to push something in a different direction and make the same meaning and sense of it, to me, is a thriving student. I reckon building relationships. Like, I was really bad at, like, being social and, like, talking and like stuff in year 12 like help like especially research project that's helped me to talk to people and socialize and i feel like that's important to like go out in the world and like talk and like communicate like especially if you want to get a job or something and you've got to like put yourself out there taking what they learn and applying it to other areas is really uh you know um is really important i think um if they can see uh, in some cases uh, with some subject it might be a practical use in everyday life um, in others, it might be just going away and reflecting on what they've learnt and thinking about, um, you know, how how those uh, their, their I guess their perception of the world around them um, and how that changes um, how it changes their their thinking. 
the ability to be very personable, the ability to be a, a good communicator, um, and to be able to resonate with other people and understand how they can um, translate what they're saying to different audiences as well, I think is really important. Someone who is not only so focused on the academic aspects, I suppose, but they're also socially pretty comfortable. They are able to, I don't know, step outside their comfort zone and really get out there into the world. They're not afraid of what might be to come, say uni and beyond even. To be able to actually start developing those concepts with meaning behind it. So rather than just learning terminology or a definition, um, to be able to actually learn, well, what does that actually mean in real life? What impact is that going to have on me in the future? Um, how can I help to prevent something or help encourage something else? Um, and just to really get them thinking about their place in the world. The way the world's panning out, uh, jobs are for shorter and shorter periods of time. Um, you're almost constantly beyond the market or looking for new opportunities. And so you need to be always ready to take advantage of an opportunity and not just sit back and wait for the world to offer you something. Um, in order to do that, you need to be ready. You need to be ready to take advantage and know what you're good at, know what you're not good at, know what, what gaps you have to fill, need to fill and, and how you need to achieve filling those goals. I can't let other people choose my place for me. I can let them guide me or influence my decision, but it, overall it comes down to me. If we can, uh, as a society, provide students with that opportunity to reach that point, um, whether it be, um, you know, it could be something as simple as feeling like they belong, you know, um, then I think we as a society, as parents and, and, and a broader society, I think we've done the right job. All right, so I think oh, I've already made that point about these things. The, these elements of Thrive are designed to be in interdependent. If you were working on one, if we were developing one, we're probably activating um, some of those others. And I didn't want it to be a new story. I didn't want it to be a big change. Um, I wanted it to be going deeper with the story that we've already got in South Australia, for it to be the natural next step for us in where we're going um, as an education system responding to the changes um, in the world and the demands that uh, are on us and are on young people. I wanted it to be a story for your school. I didn't want, I want to stop the space board from uh, operating too much in a bubble. It's got to be a partnership with us. So it's got to be about your school and making sure that your school can find, your, that you can find your story in this as well. And the curriculum and assessment helps you to uh, prosecute your agenda as well. There's so all things like belonging, you know, yes, we know that they're closely connected to achievement, but it's bigger than that. It is about developing young people who can thrive. And it's probably one way or another already in your improvement strategy, already in your thinking and where you're taking your, uh, your site and your school. So, you know, again, I'm asking this question, how could, how should curriculum assessment and certification help you to prosecute your agenda to help young people to thrive. Because this can only be achieved with partnership between the SACE board and schools. We're all working in one system. It's a complex system. We've got so many moving parts, so kind of unpredictable. It's not complicated. You can't know that even though there's lots of bits going on, that one part moves and the other parts will move in a, in a predictable way. It doesn't work like that, right? It's too complex for that. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a cloud, all the bits move, you can't get all the bits. It's got a shape, but it keeps moving and, um, and we're all in there, we're all in that system. All the bits all have to move uh, together. I'm going to stop for a second, and I've got uh, what I would like you to do is just to take a moment. And all these things I'm saying about the SACE board, yeah, it's the SACE board, but how is, it, how is it our story, our common purpose that we have? How is it your story in your site, in your school? And perhaps because you've not got much, lots of time, I might just get you to focus on, you know, what are the things that you think, yeah, we're really advanced in that, we're doing all kinds of the great things there. And what's the biggest challenge for your school and your community? Over to you, just for a couple of minutes. <laughs> All right, I might try and bring us back together, if I can. We've, we've got some 
microphones in the room. So there's one, there's one over there and there's one over here by this camera. Anyone happy, willing to share what they were talking about? How this does or doesn't connect with your story or what you see as being our, our shared common purpose in South, South Australia? Fair enough. Um, <laughs> let me try and answer my own question. I mean, one of the things that we'd certainly looked at that was really influential uh, upon us when we were putting this together was the, the Asper uh, paper um, that uh, Alan Reid wrote. And of course, uh, Sasper being really uh, a crucial player in getting this um, up. Um, some of this was certainly informing our thinking and even Alan's book as well, um, uh, informing our thinking. So I think, uh, it is that South Australian story, but I think it's a national leadership story as well about how are we as the South Australian system, not the SACE board, but how are we the South Australian system showing some um, leadership nationally as well? Because there's all kinds of different pressures and people trying to pull different systems in different uh, directions. I was on the call for the uh, national, uh, national formative assessment tool and the development of that. And one of the things that they pitched about that was, what we'll do is we'll have these tests that students would be able to do, and it'll show where they're up to in the literacy and numeracy, and then it'll point them to the resources on Scootle that they'll be able to go to, to develop wherever the gaps are. Oh. I don't think that's leadership. I don't think that's where we want to go. I don't think that's our story. I think that's somebody else's story. Okay, so recognizing that we're working in a system and that if you want to have impact within a complex system, a system that adapts to change, um, uh, it's difficult to have impact. You can't do it by standing still and you can't do it from one perspective. We need to have these partnerships. We're changing the way that we're working at the SACE board uh, because we want to represent the system better. Um, you don't care about the inner workings of the SACE board. Uh, but uh, I just want to show it to you very quickly as an example of the kinds of changes that we're putting in place. We used to work like this, um, and it's entirely appropriate to work like this in the past, I think. What we would do is we'd look for some output, the star there, and we would we'd build it. We'd define what we wanted, what we wanted to do, build the thing, release it. There's the new subject outline. You know, There's the exam, whatever it is. We might support educators to say, you know, so here it is, this new subject, the new subject outline. Now you go and put it into practice. That was the old model. Um, that model is full of risk. <laughs> because, it, because the assumptions that you make up front don't necessarily hold when it hits the classroom. And so we do consultation. And yeah, we change the, the, the work that we do in response to the consultation. But still, the core is still there. It's still... It still sits there as it is. And so we end up essentially in a kind of announce and defend position in a complex system. Because what we do is say, well, this is it now. And we put it in place and it stays in place and it looks like that. And you do the best you can with it and we defend it. And then, you know, it's a pretty good product, but, it, but it's not dynamic enough for a changing world. Um, that was great. I mean, worked really well before, but I don't think it's going to work for us anymore. The system has to change. And so the way that we're working at the SACE board now is we're using a formal agile methodology. And what that means is that we really shorten those cycles. So we actually work on these formal six-week cycles. So when we're doing something like subject renewal, we'll say, okay, so what does, what's that product going to be? What's the, what are we going to develop in six weeks that's got the maximum value? So we'll develop a thing. We'll check in with, at the early stages, we might just check in with some critical friends. We'll check in. We'll make sure that we're getting value out of that. We'll go off then and we'll do the next piece of work and then we'll check in again with partners. And we might have a bigger group of educators who we draw on from across the system now to, to, to do that sense check and to give us some advice. And then we'll do that again. And we'll build that thing in that sort of way, adding the maximum value, not predetermining what the product looks like. Yes, we're going to predetermine that we want, a, I don't know what, a cybersecurity subject or whatever it might be. But we want this new subject. and We want it to have great value. Uh, we're going to renew psychology and we want it to have fantastic value. But we're not going to assume what it's going to look like at the end and then build that thing. We're going to work on it. Say, well, what if we put cyber psychology into psychology? What if we put indigenous psychology into psychology? What would that look like? 
What would have to be true to make that successful? How would we have to support educators? What would that mean? Who would we get in to support people? Where are the resources to do that? Let's think all those things. And if it turns out that we don't want to do that and there's no value, well, we'll go back to the beginning of the cycle. We'll start again and say, well, that's not working. Let's do something else. If it is working, we'll go through those cycles. The support has got to go on beyond that. The support can't just be, well, here it is. Uh, we've got to work with you, with your sectors, with your schools, uh, in that the usage of that product, of that new subject, whatever it might be. And we have to keep doing those cycles. We can't do set and forget. We have to say, you know, after a year, 18 months, is this working? Where's the value? Let's amplify that and get more value out of it. Where's the not value? Let's get rid of that or dampen that down because that's not adding so much value. That's quite a different change for, for us in the way of working. But it's a change that is trying to respond to complexity. It's a change that's trying to respond to us not being the SACE board existing in our bubble, but the SACE board existing within the system, being part of the system, being able to change over time. And so we changed that risk profile because what we've done is we've made this thing together. And yeah, we're responsible for the standard and we're responsible for some of that content and those other things. But we are together responsible for the value that comes out of that thing. So we have to change the way that we're working in order to be able to do that. And what that does is it means we get better partnerships with school. If there's an industry engagement or university engagement, if that's appropriate, then we get to do that at, at more points along the way. We get to think about what's the professional learning for people to be involved in the SACE board through these cycles. Uh, we get broader involvement of staff from schools in the development of these subjects or these exams or whatever the process is. It allows us to be more responsive and what we're trying to do always is to maximize value together with you. Because what we do doesn't have inherent value until it connects with you and your schools and your students. That's, it's only at that point that the value is achieved. And so things like the research project, we're building a new research project and we're building it in this way. What's the research project going to look like when we finished it? Honestly, I don't know. Because we're not building a predefined thing. What we're saying is, let's imagine if we had a research project and it was a research project that was a, an entrepreneurial research project or a research project that connected with students' vocational education. What, what would that look like? What would have to be true to make that successful? Because probably writing down lots of evidence of your learning and then us marking that probably isn't it. So what does that look like? How do, you do, how do you do that? How do you get value out of that? All right, well, that's going to be our next cycle. We'll think about how, how you would get value out of that. And we might not. We might go back and say, you know, that really is the way of doing it. But we're testing value at every stage. So if the thrive is the why, and the, because of this looking for maximum impact, dealing with complexity, working in partnership with you, if that's the how we're doing it, of course what you want to know is, yeah, but that's all right, but what are you going to do? What's, what's the what you're going to do? So this is uh, on a printed version of our strategic plan. Um, we've got these kind of three steps. On the right-hand side there, you can see we're talking about the thriving learner. We're keeping our eye on making sure that's our purpose. We're keeping our eye on what does it look like for a student to thrive. In order to develop a thriving learner, we need to make sure we've got a qualification, a connected qualification, a qualification that students connect to, a qualification that connects to students' pathways. And of course, from our point of view, we need to change the way that we work in order to be able to deliver that in a way that maximizes value. So we're changing the way that we work at the SACE board, and that's the, the point on the left-hand side, that we want to be a bold leader in this space. But if we get to the what, we've talked a lot about the learner profile, and that's a core part of the strategic plan now. Thinking about capabilities, how we would capture capabilities, we would evidence capabilities, and we would use that as part of the certification. And that through doing that, now we are getting closer to certifying lifelong learners. We're still doing it within the subjects. We're still doing it within the disciplines. But we've got to, we're broadening it out, and we're thinking about how we do that in the capabilities as well. Micro-credentials are clearly coming. It's interesting to see across Australia and the world how different people think about this in different ways. So we've really got to get hold of it and make sure that it adds maximum value to our system. Um, 
we can see that there's some things emerge. You know, cybersecurity probably is the one that we keep coming back to as an example. But uh, we can get if we did, you know, did a cybersecurity subject and put that in place, it would it would go out of date really quickly if we didn't have industry engagement. Uh, so we've got to have the industry involved in some of these things to make sure that if we're being agile and we're being dynamic, that we are uh, engaging with industry to make sure that our students are thinking in the ways um, that are important for the outside world. Of course, we're also working on um, the outcomes of the stage two review. So we're working on new research project, new personal learning plan, and the uh, VET recognition register. Uh, different sectors have got different policies around VET and some interesting challenges around VET funding coming. But as far as the SACE board's concerned, if uh, uh, students are doing accredited VET, we will recognize it. We won't be placing any limits uh, on students who are doing appropriate VET uh, that's accredited. And of course, carrying on uh, making improvements and innovations in things like assessment, so our electronic assessment, not because we want to do electronic assessment for the sake of it, but because it gives us new ways to assess, new ways of thinking about assessment. And making sure that we get those elements of thrive into the assessment as well. Uh, developing curriculum, so changing our processes around things like curriculum renewal, uh, shortening some of the timescales so that we can work with you in partnership and say, well, what's working, what's not working, changing uh, subjects even when they're in the field, so that we're not doing that set and forget. And even thinking about some of our quality assurance processes. If you take that example of the research project and you say, well, maybe we don't have to see written evidence of students' work. Well, how, do you, how do you quality assess that? How do you make sure that the community has got confidence in it, that we've all got confidence in it, that the students have got confidence in that uh, assessment if we've not... Um, uh, if we've not got written work, you know, some real, some real interesting opportunities there. We've also, with the strategic plan, launched Prescient, our uh, professional development part of the SACE board now. One of the things that we've seen is that we had, many of you will have engaged one way or another with the Institute for, for um, Educational Assessment. <laughs> I was going off on a tangent then, um, and uh, and the course that was, was that was run there. What we want to do is to make sure that we're working with sectors uh, to deliver to deliver professional learning. Make sure that we're working with the associations to de deliver pre professional learning around the sex, um, and that professional learning might be about uh, you know some of the changes that are occurring in the SACE around capabilities, um, so that we that we're supporting you more in that process of putting changes, putting new things into practice in schools. Uh, a number of things that we're doing internally, but the one I just wanted to reinforce again was this idea of really strengthening our partnerships with you, uh, with industry, with academics and with others uh, to make sure that we are adding maximum value. Um, and the f financial sustainability piece is a, a, always a challenge, and a challenge uh, for us at the SACE board. We have our SACE international program that generates revenue for us. Uh, so we've got now got students doing the SACE in China, Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Pacific Islands. Um, and though, and th that's a commercial arrangement with those schools, and that generates revenue for the SACE that allows us to support some of these programs. So in our strategic plan, this is a lot of the what. And then well, as we're developing this, what's happening at the same time? We've got the Shea Gold Review, the review of senior secondary pathways. So an outcome of the Gonski 2 uh, review uh, that Wendy was on. I don't know Wendy's here somewhere. And one of the recommendations from that, Wendy, was uh, a review of senior secondary. And so Peter Sheargold who was the Chancellor of Western Sydney University, still is the Chancellor of Western Sydney University, and is now the chair of NESA, the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, which is kind of the equivalent of the SACE board in New South Wales. So Peter did, so he did the review, and then New South Wales went, oh, we'll have him, and, and got him in New South Wales. And what he says in the review is the opposite to what they do in New South Wales. It's going to be fascinating to see what happens uh, there in that state. 
But in the, even on the website for the review, this is what Peter said about himself. And I just want to stop again and take this opportunity to ask you the same questions. Isn't this what we're all dealing with? Isn't this kind of our story in South Australia? You know, uh, isn't this your story? Um, I'm going to stop again and throw over to you. Uh, do you recognise this? Have you got? Is this part of your cohort? Does this look like your students? Is this? Are we? Are we helping students like Peter Sheargold to thrive? How does the SACE help? And how, at the moment, does it get in the way? Over to you. All right, I might draw us back together again if I can. So I wanted to just say a few things about the Sheer Gold Review. Uh, because it is, it is going to shape... It is going to shape Australian education. It's going to make a difference to us in South Australia. Um, back. Uh, there's a strong equity thread through the Sheer Gold Review. Uh, so this first, first finding, uh, so in the review at the beginning, they got a list of findings, and they got a list of the recommendations. This is the first finding. I don't like this. And the reason I don't like it is because it says opportunity. And, and you know, I've said it before, you know, you know opportunity is not enough. Um, it's great to have the opportunity, but we're going to make sure that the students who perhaps don't have the agency to, take, to make the most of those opportunities are supported to do so, either to have the agency or to, take the to make the most of the opportunities. So, yeah, we need an equitable access and opportunity but we have to be more proactive than that. We can't just provide opportunity. Um, finding finding 6.1 later on from the Sheer Gold Review. Yeah, I think a really strong message. And then finally, I want to share with you this one, going back to section one of the review, finding 1.4. And finding 1.4 ends with this. And that's a challenge for us. And our senior secondary, our senior secondary schooling system is a system. It's us. It's all of us working together to achieve uh, this that's set out in the in the Sheer Gold review. In the review, we talk a lot about the ATAR as well and how the ATAR works against that equity. How the ATAR works against um, um, some of the positive choices that students might make how the ATAR can work against things like students having that agency and being lifelong learners, focusing them on performance perhaps a little bit too much and not on the learning, um, which is a familiar <laughs> conversation that we don't have to have again. Um, it talks a lot about vocational education, the role of vocational education. There's lots of recommendations, some recommendations about we really shouldn't have vocational education as a bit of a separate certificate Whatever our senior secondary certificate looks like, it should have the school subjects, the traditional school subjects, and the vocational education, and we should value those equally within the qualification. But well, we already do in South Australia. We've already got that strength. Uh, it talks a lot about career development um, and tr the need for develop, uh, developing better career development uh, for schools. This was a review of pathways. It's not a review of senior secondary, it's a review of pathways. So this particular focus on students' pathways. I just want to pick out a few of the key recommendations. You'll see that the Sheer Gold Review talks about explicitly about introduce a learner profile. Um, so now it's there's now there's a challenge for the nation. Introduce a learner profile. 
um, we should be evidencing the capabilities. It actually talks about micro-credentialing in schools, what that might look like and the value that that might have. So helping students to kind of customize their senior secondary experience. So it might not be whole subjects or those big, you know, semester long chunks. It might be smaller uh, 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 units of learning um, that might not be offered through school, might be offered through others. Um, and what the, and the value of that. It's a challenge for us as the SACE board to think about how would we include that in the SACE? How would we make sure that students get value of that in the SACE as well as uh, the inherent value of that learning? Uh, it talks about education authorities' role in industry engagement as well. And lots about career pathways and VET. There's a couple of other things it talks about, and I think there's going to be some really interesting things that happen here. <laughs> Uh, literacy and numeracy. It suggests an, an assessment of literacy, numeracy and digital literacy in year 10. I can hear your hearts sinking. You know, kind of, another one? <laughs> do we need to do that again? It's going to be interesting to see what that looks like. If this was a formative assessment, it, I think it would change it. I think it would change the feel of it. If this was to say, you know, where are you? And where do you want to get to? And how do we help you to see, you know, where you are and how you're thinking in your literacy and numeracy and, and digital? I think that would be an interesting, uh, an interesting thing for us to explore. One of the things that's going on with the Shear Gold Review at the moment is there's lots of education recommendations. There's lots of uh, training recommendations. And so federally, what they're doing is they're saying, well, which of these things are education? Which are training? There's some in the gray area. They're going to push them one way or another. And they're also talking about which are we going to deal with nationally and which are we going to deal with at a, at a state level? And that's going to be really interesting to see how they do that. Because, it, because there's some challenges there if this was at a national level and it was something that you know would make your heart sink. Um, that would be a real challenge for us in South Australia, I think. But if we were really thinking about how could we help students have agency in the literacy, numeracy, and digital literacy, I think that would change the, change the story quite a lot. It also has got a recommendation in there about the recognition of cultural competencies of Aboriginal students. <laughs> I think that's fascinating because we're not going to test that. <laughs> that's not a test. So what is it? What does the assessment of that look like? Um, that might be something that's that's different. That might actually be something that really opens up the way that we think about assessment in Australia and what the evidence required for assessment might look like. But of course, you know, it's no, um, it's no accident that the SACE uh, strategic plan looks so much like the Shear Gold Review. We had a strong voice in shaping some of the Shear Gold Review. Um, we were trying to anticipate some of the uh, things that would be on the on the minds of the ministers across Australia and really trying to position South Australia as having a leadership role in this. Because if we don't, someone else will. And if someone else does, then that'll be their story and we'll be doing their story, not doing our story. So this really is trying to position the South Australian system, not the SACE board, all of us together, the South Australian system as leading in this area. Um, even the career and pathways recommendations and some of the vocational education um, recommendations really sit quite comfortably with the, uh, the intent of the uh, SACE board strategic plan. So we've got these two stories, the Australian story and the South Australian story, an opportunity for the Australian story to be influenced because of the Shear Gold Review and positioning us in, in South Australia as leaders in that story. Um, the advertiser two weeks ago um, had this on the front page about how teens' jobs will count for year 12. Uh, that was really talking about the learner profile and where students' capabilities might come from. How would we evidence those things? It might not be from school. It might be from outside of school. The reason I wanted to share this with you was just to say, look at the alignment that we've got. Across this article, it just captured the whole thing for me. Um, if I look at the, just at the bottom there, uh, Lara Golding from the union talking about how um, we really need to think about assessment, how it should reflect students in this broader way. It wasn't in the paper version, but it was in the uh, online version. We've got students talking about how it makes a lot of sense, employers saying, you know, students are getting these valuable skills from um, um, part-time work or you know, might be working in the family business, working on the farm, you know, whatever that might look like. 
got Stuart Mossman, who we've got a really strong relationship. When Peter was talking before about the relationship between the SACE board and uh, the schools, again, another really strong relationship between the SACE board and SATAC. We've been just really working on that relationship and making sure that that relationship is particularly working for our students during the COVID-19 and try and making sure that students know that between us and SATAC, we'll make sure that whatever happens, students will have a transition to university if they want to go to university. But he's, and I know that Chris Russell, the, the journalist, would have been looking for someone to say, no, that's a terrible idea. And everybody's saying in South Australia, everybody's saying, yeah, we should do that. Uh, even the minister, you know, really getting in front of it and saying, you know, South Australia is really well placed to pioneer in this space. That, uh, that we as a system can lead uh, in this space. Get people lined up like that, you really start to feel like you can get things done. And the project that we're working on together, so that project around the capabilities, evidence in the capabilities to develop a learner profile, uh, would be SASPA, the SACE Board, Catholic Education, uh, the Independent Schools Association, all working together with Sandra Milligan, who you, lots of you know, I think is one of the best thinkers about assessment um, in Australia from the University of Melbourne. Um, I've had a long uh, relationship with Sandra uh, from working with her, um, uh, working with her with, on some research that I was doing when I was at Flinders years ago. And just the, the sharpness of her thinking, the way that she thinks about assessment, um, as I say, I think he's kind of world leading, if not nationally leading. One of the things that Sandra says over and over again is that South Australia is uniquely positioned to do this work on capabilities. Not best, but uniquely. We've got so much going for us. We've got our system that works as a system, including SATAC and all the others who are working with it, who are working with the education system to make this work. Um, when we think about you know where these projects going, we're all doing kind of different things. I think some of the independent schools who are involved in the project are using it to position themselves in, in the market. So they should. They're saying you know this is what it looks like to come to our school because all schools do that. Um, the Catholic se sector is using it in a slightly different way in order to develop some of the, the values of Catholic education. And so he's using the think about those kind of Catholic. Um, uh, some of those specific capabilities. So still in the same broad direction, going off in, on, on a slightly different direction at the end, but what they're doing is building capability, um, building capability in the development of capabilities, how you would evidence capabilities, all moving together um, in this, including, as I said, SASPA and the SACE board. So we, what we've got in across, again, our system is this coherence. We're doing something that's bold, that really nobody else really could do, as Sandra was saying. We're doing this in a collaborative way. And this diversity that we've got between the sectors and all and the SACE board and all of us working together, this diversity creates this diversity of, diversity is really important for knowledge generation because we're all trying out different things, learning from each other, adding value as we move forward. So I just want to share with you, just to end, just want to share with you just one example, one asset of where we've got to. When we started on this journey, we chose a entrepreneurial, but it's much more of a kind of personal enterprise construct for a capability. Uh, working with entre the entrepreneurial schools, working with other schools, thinking about what that would look like. Um, it's been a, quite a long journey, but we picked one. What we didn't want to do was presume what it looks like at the end and build to that. We pick one capability and we're driving that one capability through to learn in these cycles um, as we go. And so, of course, we'll, so just let me show you the structure of the thing. Uh, what we're looking for, what we're looking at in the capabilities is to have a progression. So it's not an achievement standard. It's a progression. What would a, a learning pathway look like for a student? We'll look at the dimensions of that progression. So what are the specific things within that uh, progression? In this case, the personal enterprise progression. Then we say, okay, so what are the indicators that would show us something about those components of that progression? And then, of course, looking at the quality criteria, what does that kind of look like? What are we looking for? How would we know this thing when we see it? So if we look at this as a personal enterprise progression, 
this is a work in progress. So don't take this away. <laughs> this is going to be it. But this is our work in progress. This is right where we're up to today. Um, a progression. So if we're looking at the kind of novice um, part of the progression, we're looking at, you know, that idea of they're able to plan and progress to produce an artifact, some outcome with some prompting and some support and scaffolding. You can see that idea of, you know, just getting going on this personal enterprise progression. One of the important things of this is that if you don't provide evidence, if there's no evidence, we're not assuming that it's not there. We just don't know. We're just not seeing that evidence. That's important for a progression rather than achievement standard. If you've not seen it, you can't assume that it's not there. You can only, pro you can only look for the evidence that's provided to you. Well, if we go to the dimensions and the indicators, one of the dimensions that we're using is this idea of mobilizing resources and networks. And then you can see that within that, uh, the parts of that are things like mobilizing physical resources, mobilizing knowledge, mobilizing networks, human connectedness, um, deep understanding and skillful action. And so then the quality descriptions of that. And so we, as we move up through the uh, progression, you can see that that gets more and more sophisticated until we're at the top level where we're looking at that proficient uh, aspect of the progression. So we're seeing that creativity, that pursuing of opportunities to deliver a high value uh, product or to deliver that high value um, outcome for the community. So that's what we're working on at the moment. What's one of the artifacts that we've been working on to progress this story. Our next steps are to go through this process of making sure that we're adding value in each cycle, validating it with teachers, working with others in the projects, looking around the world to define what the next capabilities and other constructs might be that we will work on and include in the SACE learner profile. So now that we've got this idea of Thrive and these elements of Thrive, this is the purpose of the SACE board. This is the why of the SACE now. Um, I really consider it to be yeah, an ambitious step our ambitious next step in our South Australian story. It, it doesn't fit with other states and territories as well as it fits with South Australia. Well, we've got to, with things like our teachers' judgment around the performance standards, sets us up in a way that we can use progressions in a way that other states and territories might not be able to. They've got a long way to catch up. But it's not an add-on. It, it's a system shift. I know I didn't like that COGS um, analogy before about it being a machine, but it will require all the cogs to move. It, it requires everyone to shift a bit. It requires the system to move because we're working in a complex adaptive system and it's going to require that shift of all of us. And so it's that partnership that we talked about is going to be crucially important. This isn't about the SACE board just changing some of its output. This is about us working together on our system to progress our story. Everyone will have received the email uh, <laughs> about the launch pad and some of the uh, assets that are online uh, that you might use with your communities to, com to communicate where this is going. Um, that's my email address. Um, I'm sure mo lots of you have that. I'm really keen to hear from you individually. It's a shame we can't do a bit more interactive networking, but of course it's the times that we live in. Really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Of course, we'll take some questions, but thanks for listening to me today.